if you put in $100,000 and you're making 7% of $100,000 on a seven cap, a seven cap means you're making 7% of what you paid into the deal when you pay a property cash. The cap rate is the amount of money that you make as a return on your investment. And so if you invest $100,000 in your cash on cash return, if it's divided on equal shares of equity, you're making 7% on your $100,000. Today's guest has over $600 million in real estate assets under management. You are in for a treat to talk about all things real estate, money, investing. Please welcome Mr. Jerome Maldonado. Thank you, Dan. Appreciate you having me. It's exciting to be here, man. Okay, when I say six hundred million, talk talk me through that. Like when people are out there listening, that just sounds like a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. Like how does that? How does it start? Was the first investment a couple hundred thousand, a couple million? Like walk us through the beginning of how the heck you got to this place. It's been a journey more than it has been just a, a place that you get to, right? It, and it's really come from just consistency of everything that we've done. I, when I started, I, I'm really with a four hundred and sixty credit score, and I started um, with about one hundred and six thousand dollars in debt. And, um, and I bought a little rental house. I had a little construction company I started after getting put out of business. Um, we, the FTC shut down a direct sales company that I was part of back in the 90s. And I started in 1998. It's 25 years of just consistency and just little assets growing from uh, one single family home to duplicate it to two, then eight, then 12, and then taking that money at the same time and revolving it into commercial assets, retail, getting crushed by the recession. Um, and then it was a decision that we made in 2016 that um, I was stagnant and it was the uh, means of us going out and actually scaling um, our means of uh, creating capital from uh, investors. And then from 2016 to where we are today is really where we expanded and grown. Hmm. Um, I learned a lot along the way. So Jerome, this is really important. When someone wants to first consider getting into real estate, what are the first thing they should be doing? Is it studying? Is it finding a mentor? Is it researching? Just diving right in. What should people be doing when they first want to get involved in real estate? I, I tell them just keep it simple. But yeah, absolutely, 100%. They need a mentor. Um, I didn't have one. Um, I did it through the means of banging my head against the wall. And that's why it took me 25 years to yep. get to where, I, where I'm at now. Um, I could have probably done what I'm doing now in less than 10 years. And so the first thing they should do is educate themselves, the basic stuff, you know, and it's it, for anybody that's an athlete, it's the same thing as going back to the basics, what coaches tell you to do when you're even a professional athlete is what all the best of the best do. And the same thing in real estate, learning how to underwrite deals, the simple profit and loss stuff in real estate. That's probably the most, the number one most important thing that they need to do. And um, having, a, having some type of guidance with a mentor is probably the, a, the key component to success. So in the real estate space, there's flipping houses, there's short-term rentals, there's Airbnbs, there's Section 8 housing, there's multifamily, there's so many options. How do people choose their first time investing in real estate? Invest in something that makes sense to them because really they, they all, even though it's widespread, they all do flow together. Um, I started in single family rental homes. I've evolved over the years. Um, I didn't like dealing with the tenants, so I got into commercial real estate. Um, I found that with commercial tenants, they'd sign three-year, five-year leases, way easier to manage. And I was able to buy it uh, at distressed prices and I was able to stabilize them um, almost, uh, nothing's risk-free, but with a lot less risk. And my upside with almost the exact same amount of money that I put into a single family home, I could buy a retail building that was distressed and spend $250,000 on that dump a little bit of money into renovations and have four times the income flow and, and the safety. So I, I like distressed assets when you're getting started. And I think the place where people should invest in, in my opinion, would be more distressed commercial retail um, or distressed office or repositioning of those assets as opposed to single family homes. Although I wouldn't discourage them from any of them just to get the experience. But the first, the most important thing when they first get started is to get into something that they're gonna win on because the first one is, is the most important, whether it's a $500 win, a $600 win, a $10,000 win, they just need a win on their first one. That's the biggest thing. So when is it like start time? You know, I'm working my job, I'm making 60 grand a year, or 80 grand a year, or 100 grand a year, and I've been saving up some money. How do I know when am I financially capable to actually start my first real estate investment? When you make a decision, it's, it's, all, it's, a, it's a conscious decision. It's like any business owner, like when did you know that you were 
um, you had enough finances to start your first business? Because I know you. <laughs> I was 17. I saved up $43,000 working at three different jobs selling peanuts and cracker jacks and at the stadium. And I, I said, up 43 grand. I thought it was going to last me for two years. And two months later, I ran through all it's the gone. money. Yeah. Yeah. And so it, it's the same thing. It really comes down to a decision. It has nothing to do with uh, having a certain amount of money in your pocket. Um, everything in entrepreneurship, real estate, they all flow in alignment. It really comes down to a decision and saying it's time. And like, there's no perfect time to get married. There's no perfect time to have kids. There's no perfect time to start a business. It's when you make a decision that the time is right. And so it's today, you know, if you want to get started in real estate, today is the day you get started in real estate. So how did you know this was the thing, like that real estate was going to be your thing? I didn't. I, uh, I got started. I was looking for anything that would make me money. I just wanted to make it, you know, when, when you're a kid that comes from the other side of the train tracks and you're, and, and I was taught as a young kid that people only got wealthy if they would uh, inherit wealth or they won the lottery. <laughs> you know, one of, one of the big things is, uh, is just making a decision. And for me, when I got started investing in real estate, I didn't know it was my thing. I, I was looking for a vehicle that would protect me from going broke long term. And I was pouring concrete because when we, what ended up happening was we were in the direct sales industry. We got shut down in 1997. I opened up a little door-to-door -door sales company in 1997 just to make ends meet. We were selling to companies like, um, uh, like Pizza Hut, um, dry cleaners, big O tires. And we were making a little bit of money, but we weren't getting wealthy. And so I got into construction on accident. They were, you, you know, the waterfall on the top of your hill over here, that's a mm -hmm. fake faux rock. Mm -hmm. Well, I took a little seminar on that stuff, um, on how to do that stuff. And we started bidding projects like um, the um, Rainforest Cafes. Yeah. There was a restaurant called Margarita's down in Utah, in Sandy Lee, Utah, that they did indoor diving on. Well, those were like my claim to fame because I bid those projects. And when I went in there, I was at a point where I was in financial distress and I, I felt like I had nothing to lose and everything to gain. So I said, I said screw it. If I'm just going to bid these things. If I get them, then great. I'm going to figure out a way mm -hmm. to do them. And so by the grace of God, what I thought was a lot of money wasn't a lot of money because I didn't have a lot of overhead. And I got some of those jobs. And from that, I started investing in little pieces of real estate. So I, have an, I had an asset that I had to show for my money. And that was as simple as it was. And I continued in traditional business. And I would, I would make a few million dollars a year. You know, I had a company that would do like 2 million that grew to like 4 million. And then we did a, a little house building company that we would buy land, build houses. And I would take that money and I would build a few homes a year, make a few hundred grand net profit. And I invested in more real estate. And then just through growing those asset bases, it grew to retail where I was building them brand new in 2004. And then four years later into the recession, we almost got crushed with retail. And so I wanted out of real estate, sure. but I needed a means to be able to pay for all this stuff without going bankrupt. So I started buying more real estate in Phoenix where it was really financially distressed. And we started picking up like single family homes for like $25,000, $40,000. We started picking up fourplexes for like $35,000, $40,000. And I built a little portfolio of about $4 million worth of real estate for about, and it, I, I was all out of pocket for just under 900 grand. Wow. So we were able to evolve and, um, and, Real estate kept pulling me back for some reason. And, um, and it wasn't until really 2016 where I had a portfolio of maybe about $15 million worth of real estate that I said, we need to scale this and we need to do something that's gonna take care of us long-term forever. And that's where I really decided. And like in 2016, I said, okay, this is it. Everything that we've all done this far is great active income, but this is the only thing that we've done that gives us passive income that we can scale and we can actually have and, and rely on long-term. So when you raise capital, do you do it through syndication for one deal or through a fund or like walk us through what's the main idea when you raise capital? So you could do it multiple ways. We do, we've done all of the above. Um, one of the things that we do is if we're doing a syndication, it is property specific. So we'll go in and, uh, and there's different laws and different regulations. So you're going to buy a $20 million dollar apartment building yep. and you're going to raise. So if we're going to do $20 million apartment building, you know, you're going to usually raise like right now you're going to raise one third of that. In, in capital. Okay, so, so seven gonna, million bucks. Yep. So yep. you can raise seven million dollars. You go to your SEC attorney. Yep. And um, if you can either do it with friends and family, you can do uh, Regulation 506B um, through friends and family, or you ha you can advertise it and you can do a, a 506C. And um, and so just depending on what your where your bandwidth is, like you're a, a social media person. So if I had bandwidth with social media, I would go more after the 506C because I can go out and raise capital through the means of people I don't know. If I want to um, 
if I, if I have a big network of wealthy people or not even wealthy people, but I'm going to meetups and I'm, I'm going out and have relationships with other people that are in real estate, I can do a 506B and just do friends, family and colleagues that are uh, through a 506B and I can raise it privately. And so when someone invests, let's say I'm the person at the event and you say, hey, Dan, put in 50 grand, 100 grand, 500 grand, a million, whatever the number is. What is an investor? What should I be looking for when someone approaches me with a syndication deal? Um, you should be looking at the experience. You should be vetting the experience of your general partners, um, what they've done in the past, how they've managed assets, um, what they've given in returns for their internal rates of return. Um, and I don't know what the sophistication is of the audience that's watching us right now, but your cash on cash return is the amount of money that you bear on the money you invest. So the um, so, immediately. So, so I put in a hundred grand. Walk me through it. So yeah. So if you put in a hundred thousand dollars. And you're making 7% of $100,000 on a seven cap, right? Yep. A, a cap rate of 7%. What, what's a seven cap mean? A seven cap means you're making 7% of what you paid into the deal okay. or what you paid. What a cap rate is, is when you pay a property cash. Okay. You buy a property all cash and it's paid off. And it, if you're buying it for a 7% cap rate or a 6% cap rate, the cap rate is the amount of money that you make as a return on your investment. And so if you invest $100,000 in your cash on cash return, if it's divided on equal shares of equity, you're making 7% on your $100,000. Your internal rate of return is the amount that you're making when you sell the asset. So it's your money's parked. It's like uh, compared to stocks. It's when the stock goes up and the appreciation in, in the value of that stock is sold. It's what you make when you sell the stock. So in real estate, when your cat, your internal rate of return is the appreciated value that's in that real estate when you sell it. And it's the return you make after you sell the asset. Very cool. Yeah. So, so someone approaches me and says, Hey, Dan, put a hundred grand into my $20 million property. I'm raising 7 million. Dan put a hundred grand. I'm hoping to make around 7% a year for X amount of years. Yeah. So usually there's a call time. Um, with most syndications, they're three to five years. So our business model is a little different. We do syndicate um, and we'll syndicate um, existing properties, but we're, we do a lot of ground up construction. Oh. So what we do, like our business model, and I'll kind of explain this, this is a little non-traditional than what most people do. The way we've actually scaled to where we're at, um, now that money is tight right now, um, and this for all the listeners that are listening, this is, this is a business model that you can do even on smaller assets. So if you're in construction, if you're doing fix and flips, if you're doing value add and you're already doing renovations and stuff in the construction trade, um, listen to this because this is like gold for most people. Um, and well, the reason we've been able to do this is because I have a construction background and um, we also have a real estate background. But what we do is I raise capital to buy the land. And so when I go in and I raise debt on the land, the land is non entitled, meaning that it doesn't have the permissive use to be able to build like an apartment complex on the land, for sake of example. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll buy the land at a very discounted price, maybe under a million dollars for five acres worth of land. And then what I do to create value in my land is in, I'll maybe raise two million dollars so I can get through entitlements, which is the actual permitting process where we pay for architects, engineers on like, let's say, a $20 million to $50 million development. And we'll go in and we'll entitle the entire property. We'll pay about $300,000 for the architects, the engineers. We have some, so those are all called your soft cost. And then when we're all done with the entitlements, the land value will more, a lot of times be worth three times or more what we buy for it. So if we get like, if we can put 200 units of apartments, that land's probably worth somewhere close to $6 million, mm -hmm. right? So when money's cheap, we land up going in for a construction loan and the money is in the plans. So after we get all the entitlements, we go in for the construction loan. We go to the bank with a retail value of building it out. So when we do a retail value of building it out, we go in and we, we build the product out ourselves. We collateralize the land. We exit all the investors out on our first draw for our construction loan. And then we own the entire property free and clear of any investors. And the only, the only partner we have in the entire deal is the bank. And then we land up building out the entire asset. We stabilize it. And I've been able to retain 100% of the equity in my deals that way. Um, and so what we're doing now to raise capital, since we own 100%, most syndicators give away 70% of their deal in syndication. What we're doing now is we're carving off 30% off the top end to reduce our liability um, because money's expensive right now. Construction loans are costing 10 to 11%. And what we're doing is we're reducing down our liability by giving out about 30% of the equity in our deals. 
and still only partnering with a bank and then picking and choosing who we actually work with as far as our investors. So I'm at that same party. Someone says I got a $20 million property. I need $7 million. I'm raising Dan put a hundred grand, but they offer me like 19% a year or 23% a year. What number is like too good to be true when it comes to syndication deals? So, so when you say the percentages, you know, typically anything over 12% is typically um, too good to be true. Unless you're talking about your um, internal rate of return, you know, for an internal rate of return, uh, because it's not based on an annual basis, um, your internal rate of return is your return, and you may be a return of 20%, but it's, it's collateralized over three years worth of time. So mm -hmm. if you have a 20% IRR, internal rate of return, it's a 20% over the course of the time you've owned the asset on your money, um, not, not over an annual basis. Now, when you're talking about your cash on cash return, anything over 12%, a lot of times, is um is sorry, too good to be 20 foot snake just walked by sorry Did it, yeah <laughs> <laughs> okay so, so someone you know approached me at that same event and they say i have a fund hey dan i'm raising a 20 million dollar fund in my fund we're gonna buy storage units apartment complexes rv parks etc what should i be looking for as an investor when someone says i'm raising 20 million for a, a real estate fund yeah you need to look at their deal flow uh, most important when you raise, when, because with a fund, the difference is that you're not investing in one asset. You're investing in multitudes of assets that are within that fund. And so the law is that you have 100% disclosure anytime you invest in a fund or a syndication. And so it is your duty to request the documents of what consists within that fund. And so my recommendation, anybody that is, in, is looking to invest in a fund is know exactly what the, they're investing into, what the parameters are. People that are doing regular apartment syndication funds, I wouldn't invest in them unless I knew the general partners and I knew the strength of their books. So I would audit their books right now in, in a market like we're seeing today um, because a lot of these guys, like I'll give you an example. Um, we, there's a, a fund, I won't mention the name of the group, but we just bid up against them on a, on a deal down in Tucson and the deal is worth 28 million, 27 and a half million dollars. That's all it's worth. And that's based on a 5% cap rate. Hmm. Okay. And, uh, that thing sold for $34 million at a 5% cap rate. <laughs> and it's because they have inventory already in that market. That was the justification of the, um, brokers. But the reality is that. The return on investment, you can take your money right now, Dan, and you know, you can put it in the bond market and get 4% right now, mm -hmm. and it's safe. Why in the world would you go in and write a five cap that's not even a real five cap? Because once you dilute it to $34 million, you're probably at a four cap and put that type of risk out when you can just stuff your money in a bond market and then just get a, ret a return in two years, three years that's safer than investing in some fund. So you got to be careful. You got to make sure that um, you yourself have a little bit of indicate of uh, knowledge on underwriting some of these deals, and that you really trust and vet the people that you're working with for their experience more than anything. So the person that's managing the syndicate or managing the fund, what is the typical fees I should be looking for when they approach me? For uh, the fees that they're taking? Yeah. Well, yeah, some of these guys do, they make a living on their fees, and that's that's one of the reasons they'll continue buying deals, and so. Two and a half percent is good. Um, some of these guys will charge as high as six percent. Whoa, that's a big difference. It's a big difference. <laughs> yeah, it's a big difference. And um, and they're hidden, you know, between management fees. Um, they're hidden between asset fees. And you just have to know that the fees that you're looking at when you're looking at the P&Ls, there's a, a separation between the property management fees and the asset management fees. And so when you're looking at the, at the profit and loss statements and you're looking at your, the expenses, because most people don't know. They, they get at this long 200 itemized number yeah. profit and loss statement. And they're sitting there and they're looking at every line. And they say property management. And then it says management. Well, it might be an asset management. What kind of management is it? And so 2.5% to 5% is pretty typical. Um, you start getting outside of that realm, it becomes pretty high risk. You know, These guys, they're making their monies not on the actual um, real estate. They're making it on the management fees. So someone's thinking to themselves, man, I, I can invest in a syndicate or I can invest in a fund or I can try to do it myself or I can try to do it with my friends. Like when there's so many options, how do they how do they know what they want? Like how do they figure out for themselves? How do I decide when there's so many different ways to go? As an investor? Yeah. Just as an investor strictly. Not so there so there's obviously reefs that people can invest in, right? So those are publicly traded. And you can go in and you can get a, a three point six percent return with BlackRock right now on a dividend. 
so when you look at it, you have to look at it from a perspective. And I'm a bad person to ask this to, and the reason why is because I'm very conservative when it comes to investing. So I would never personally invest in somebody else's deal unless it's getting over an 8% cap rate, hmm. and unless um, I'm getting an internal rate of return in excess of 20%, okay? And so how do you bear those numbers? Well, the only way to bear those numbers right now is to get a good deal, and there's not a lot of them out there. So you have to be underwriting deals all the time. And that's why we started building, was because in 2018, I noticed that people, cap rates were getting compressed, um, the amount that P and values were going through the roof. And so once values go through the roof, cap rates get compressed, there's only one way down from that, mm -hmm. and that it becomes a high-risk investment. So I figured, shit, I'm going to mitigate my risk by building these things. I can walk into these things at a 12% cap rate, and I have, and then I own 100% of them, and I was stabilizing these things at about a 35% equity standpoint from the bank. So we were walking in fully stabilized at 35% equity in these deals from the time we actually got a stabilized loan. So, so it, I'm a bad person to ask because I would never invest in anything that didn't have at least a seven to eight percent cap rate, and I, I push closer to the eight percent cap rate mark. So when people are asking me, I'm telling them look for a seven to eight percent cap rate, seven percent at minimum, and um, or at least a business model that's going to bear you eight percent once a good manager takes over the asset and can get that property up to an eight percent cap rate within a reasonable amount of time, which a reasonable amount of time is less than eighteen months. And if it's a stabilized asset, less than 16 months. I mean, less than six months. What do you like to invest into since you have so many options? Like, how do you decide for yourself what you invest into? So I like distressed assets. What I decide, I decide my investments are all based on time and the value of my time on my return. So what I look for is I look for opportunity where other people aren't looking. Um, like right now, a lot of syndicators don't know anything about construction. So where I benefit that they don't, the benefits I have that they don't is that I understand construction really well. So if somebody's looking at just a financially distressed asset to buy, I'm looking at also physically distressed assets. And so if you understand the financial end of it, plus the construction end of it, I'm looking where there's distress. Because where there's distress, there's money to be made and there's upside Can on it. Can you give an example of distress? You mean like husband and wife are divorcing? Uh, someone's going bankrupt? Like what does the distress mean? Yeah, so it, it's all the above. I mean, if you're looking at smaller single family stuff that uh, that a husband and wife are going through divorce, um, going through financial hard times, uh, maybe somebody's sick and ill and can't work, um, and that stuff's going into bankruptcy, that's one form of it. But when I talk about financially distress, I'm looking at it more big picture, um, is looking at being able to scale up with a little bit of what they're doing, right? So I'm, when, we're, when I'm talking about distress, I'm talking about financially distressed assets, stuff that people have overpaid for. Hmm. Because when times are good, um, people think that those good times are gonna continue going forever. And you and I both know that that's not the case. You've lived through, some, you've lived through a couple recessions. I've lived through three recessions. And you get bottlenecked. When money's good, times are good. When, t when money gets tight, when money gets expensive like it does now, um, distressed assets become extremely attractive. And when I say distressed, I'm not just talking about physically distressed, I'm also talking about financially distressed. And right now, there's a lot that's coming to the market where people had, for example, 5-1 arms, which is basically what that means is it's a, an adjustable rate mortgage. After five years, it becomes adjustable to the market. So if they had it at a 25 or 3% interest rate, and the, the, and it, their note is now called, and, it, and now they, they're on a fluctuating rate mortgage, they may be paying 7% on that. Now, if they bought that asset at 4% return, how do you pay a 4% return right. if you have a 7% interest, hmm. right? You can't even afford your debt. So now it becomes a financially distressed asset because you don't, there's, there's a, there's a teeter-totter effect for where do you get it back in alignment? And that's where we come in. So if it's financially distressed through the means of relationships and shopping for this stuff, we're able to come in and, and offset that balance and find some of these deals where, they're financially distressed and people can't do them. They're, on, they're, they're staring bankruptcy in the eyes. And um, it opens doors and opportunities for investors from single family to multifamily to retail to office and all around. All right. So we talked a lot about making money, investing money. We like to wrap up and talking about giving some money away to charity. Yep. How do you decide for yourself what type of charity you invest into? And for the listeners that are out there, how can they look around to make decisions for themselves about what type of place that they can donate money to? Yeah. So... That, I think each individual, it's where your heart sits, right? Um, so early childhood development for me is real important. Um, I grew up dyslexic. 
Um, I was never a straight A student in, in school. In fact, I was always the kid that uh, was throwing spit watch to get out of reading in class, right? So I, I'd rather sit in a corner than, uh, I'd rather sit in a corner in trouble than have to read aloud in class. So early childhood development for me, I think sometimes um, charities are right at the heart of, um, of who you are as a person. Last question. We are in chaotic times, right? People are nervous. People are scared. There's a lot of opportunity when that happens. Yep. I always say to stay calm during the chaos. What would you say to people that are considering investing during the chaotic times? If they've never invested before, I, I tell them to take a deep breath and, um, and learn. Get educated right now. Right now is a great time to get educated. I will tell you that it's hard because right now there's so much opportunity, right? But if you're not careful and you haven't educated yourself, you can end up losing big during these times. So education is key. And in times of distress, there is massive, massive opportunity. But everybody has the uh, golden bucket of gold at the end of the rainbow. And one of the biggest uh, problems in the entrepreneurial space is that um, people are looking at it through their phones and social media and they feel like they're missing out on something. 90% of these people are broke. And so you got to be careful what you're investing in. And so if you don't know yourself what to invest in, my recommendation is to educate yourself first. Get good at one thing. And I think so many people have the shiny object syndrome. They're everywhere. And one thing that I've done, Dan, over the years is I've always stayed focused in my lane. There's been times where I've had friends that have gone in, they've made a shit ton of money in the finance space, or they've made a shit ton of money in courses and education, or they made a shit ton of money doing some, doing debt consolidation. And I've always been the guy in the construction. When, when you're out there pouring wet concrete, build, running a construction company, and someone else is out on the beach because they have a, right. it, it's real easy to get distracted. Mm -hmm. Um, but over the last 25 years, when my wife and I look at everything that, that has come and gone in front of us, one thing has been consistent. We've, most of them, not everybody, but almost everybody, we've out earned them and we're still here. And so I tell people right now, when there's so much blood on the wall and, the, and things are in chaos, either educate yourself extremely well, but don't get so broad that you lose yourself. Stay focused on one thing that you can get really good at mastering in these times and invest in that. Because it, there, there's money in anything as long as you stay focused. And the biggest thing, there's so much distraction, most people can't stay focused mm. or consistent. Uh, make sure to follow Jerome across all social media platforms. It's really important that we have these discussions about money because we all grew up thinking it's rude to talk about money. Yeah. We think it's rude to not talk about it because the majority of capital that you use, it's not the root of all evil, it's for your health, your family, your mortgage, your rent, your clothes, your everything, your food, your gasoline, your car, every little basic thing is money related. So it's okay to have discussions about money. 